Check, check. Check, 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 check. Check, check, check. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Check, one, two. Check, one, two. Okay, this should work. Then live on Facebook. All right, people, um, welcome. Um, let's wait for one more minute. Um, maybe people will still join us. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I just have to figure out to do this right. Uh, the slides. There we go. And then this I need. top can see the waiting room okay we see a lot more people than yesterday. Welcome everyone. Just getting myself organized here. I think you should be seeing the slides at the moment. Um, and the chat is open for anyone who has questions. Um, I hope you can hear me all right. I see people with thumbs up. Great. Wonderful. Okay, well, it's seven o'clock. Um, welcome to day two uh, of the Old Nubian Crash Course. Um, my name is uh, Vincent van Gerven Uy, and by some strange weather situation, we are having a one day heat wave. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit dying here inside a room with all the windows closed so that we don't have a lot of outside noises of people renovating their houses. Um, I think people will still join us in the coming five minutes and I'll, I'll let them in uh, as, they, as they enter. Um, we are also live on Facebook, so should your Zoom connection somehow drop out, then you can also follow this class live on, on the Facebook page of the Nubia Fest. 
And um, you can also uh, view this uh, a little bit later um, this evening once I've uploaded it to YouTube and I'll also post the slides uh, on Twitter and the link on Twitter and I'll also post the slides on YouTube. So hopefully you'll have uh, all the materials um, um, there as well after the class is uh, finished. So um, let's get started. Today we're going to talk about uh, noun phrases. Um, so noun phrases is just a fancy word for uh, um, for the way that we express uh, things, uh, people, objects, uh, and how we uh, encode these in a sentence. Uh, and so these uh, noun phrases are things like your subject, for example, is usually a noun phrase. An object is a noun phrase, um, but also things like in the house or uh, out in the garden or for my friend. All of these things are noun phrases. And um, they usually tell you something about uh, who is doing what, to whom, where, when, how in a sentence. And so we're going to talk today about uh, how Old Nubian encodes these types of rules uh, with its grammar. So let's get started. I have too many windows open, of course, and all these Zoom, like I have like five different tabs of Zoom or something. Okay, but I can see my own slides, so that's important. Um, so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about determination. Uh, we're going to talk about number. So like singular, plural, dual, um, case. We've got a lot of different cases in Obnubian and we'll cover them all today, uh, including all the postpositions. Um, then we're going to talk about qualification. Uh, this is like, how do you qualify a noun, for example, by an adjective or um, with a, a possessor? Um, and then that's hopefully, uh, that's hopefully the end. And we're going to try to do this within an hour. Um, yesterday we made it, I think, in 50 minutes. So, so let's hope uh, we'll, we'll make good time today as well. Although I think I'm the last panel today, the last session. So we, we have a little bit of, of time afterwards as well. So if this takes longer um, for questions or something, then, then we can do that as well. Um, if you have any questions in between, um, please flag them in the, uh, in the chat. And when I see it, then I'll, I'll respond to it. Um, but again, uh, the slides that you'll see also, I'll post a link to the PDF later. Um, so, you, you know, you have some, some way of uh, looking these over because it will be a lot of information. Um, so, uh, Old Nubian has a determiner, um, the lambda, O, um, and that's a definite determiner. And we also have a numeral well, which is the number one, which can be used as an indefinite determiner. For example, as in uh, a woman, uh, itu well. And we have also the woman, itu. Um, this uh, determiner here only appears uh, when, or mostly, nearly always appears only when um, the noun is the subject of the phrase. So for a very long time, there was a, a discussion about whether this L uh, is a determiner or maybe it's a nominative case or maybe it's a subject marker. Um, but it turns out that this is in fact uh, a determiner. Uh, it marks definite uh, noun phrases and it simply does not appear when other cases are attached to the noun. So that's why you only see the nominative case, because as we will see uh, in a little bit, the nominative case is marked with nothing. Um, this well, um, you don't see it very often used as an indefinite uh, determiner. So usually when it's just a woman, a church, you know, a town, you don't see any marking at all. Um, only when you want to make it explicit um, that there's only one, or it's a very specific one, uh, you may use this uh, numeral well uh, as, uh, uh, as an indefinite determiner. And, and also like cross-linguistically, this is not very strange. Uh, many languages have developed uh, indefinite determiners from numerals, uh, including you know, English, uh, Dutch, um, uh, French, a bunch of Indo European languages, and I'm pretty sure other language families have similar phenomena as well. Um, so here are some examples. Um, so as I said, the definite determiner nearly always appears in the context of a nominative as it is dropped before any other case marking. And we see here, uh, behold, the Magi arrived, arrived from the East in Jerusalem. This is from uh, the book of Matthew. And uh, this uh, is the story of the birth of Jesus. 
Um, and we see here uh, the Meji, who are um, the subjects of the sentence, right? The Meji are arriving uh, and uh, they are definite because there are definitely only three, if I remember correctly. Um, and you see them here marked with the determiner and with the nominative. Um, let's look at, um, oh, that was the only example. All right. Um, then we go to demonstrative pronouns. Um, there are two in uh, Old Nubian, so we only make a distinction between this here and that over there. Um, so that's kind of like in English uh, and in many other languages. Um, some uh, languages have, for example, Japanese, uh, so uh, uh, have a distinction in three, for example, something that's here with me, something that's there with you, and something that's there, you know, over there with another person. Um, but Nubian has only this uh, 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 distinction between here with me and over there. Um, they are in and man, and they have also uh, special plural forms with this additional uh, morphing in, um, and then uh, a plural marker gu, which is uh, not obligatory. Uh, and we will see later when we discuss plurals that indeed this gu is not obligatory, but when it, the demonstrative is plural, um, you always need this uh, in, as we will see. I think I have some examples here. So, um, in all these ways, beloved, deceased from, deceased from uh, hatred. Um, so, in all these ways, that's this sentence right here. Um, we have a determiner, this, um, and then the word for way, and then a, a quantifier all, and we will discuss quantifiers in one of the upcoming lectures. Quantifiers usually follow uh, the noun, and because of the quantifier, the noun is also marked with this uh, uh, predicate marker. But again, that, that's what we'll cover in a, in, a, in a different lecture. What is important here is that we see um, the demonstrative in here in front of the noun. So this way, and it's plural because this is a plural thing. So in all these ways. Uh, note that the demonstrative is not marked for plural um, itself. It is only marked for plural when it is used independently and it is plural as in this example. So these things Jesus said. So these things, um, here the demonstrative on its own forms its own noun phrase and therefore it is marked with both the plural marker and uh, the accusative right so these things that's usually what we would say in english um, but the word thing is not expressed uh, in old nubian right we only have the subject here the object and then we have the verb um, the verb looks very impressive um, also previous verbs may have looked very impressive um, and we will discuss them again in another class i think tomorrow or after tomorrow. Um, they, are, they are the most complex part of the Nubian sentence. So actually what we'll do today is still kind of like a bit of a warm up. Um, so what is, what is important to note, and we will see this also in the other examples, is that uh, in Old Nubian, noun phrases are only marked at the uh, right edge. So for example, when you have a language like uh, Latin or Greek, you mark each component of a noun phrase, like your uh, determiner, your adjective, uh, your noun. When it's in plural, all of these things are marked in plural, right? They, have, they all have their own special plural forms. When they are in accusative, they all have their special accusative forms. Um, that's not how Old Nubian works. When your noun phrase is in the accusative, you just dump the accusative marker at the very end of your noun phrase and not at everything that comes in it, right? So in other words, case uh, and plurality in Old Nubian is, uh, is not distributive, right? It's not distributed across the noun phrase. It is attached at the end, it's suffixed at the end of the phrase, right? And so that's what you can see here, for example, um, this entire thing is one noun phrase and the nominative and the topic marker come at the very end, right? This is an entire noun phrase and your locative marker comes at the end. Here, this is your entire noun phrase and my plural marking and my um, accusative case comes at the end. All right. Now, um, 
Old Nubian, as we discussed yesterday, is a literary language. Um, and so it does things that literary languages do, uh, things that you normally probably wouldn't do when you would speak it. Um, there are many things you can do in written English that you would never say in a conversation with one of your friends. Um, the same for French or for any other language, really. Like the ones, the language that you speak is really a different language than the language that you write. Um, in languages that you write, you also have uh, developments that are completely unrelated to speech. Um, people want to imitate classical writers, uh, for example. This is something you would do in writing, but it's not something you would do in speaking, right? And so, um, because at the time that Old Nubian was written, there were also several other languages, right? There was Coptic, there was Greek, um, and uh, most of the translations uh, of liturgical literature um, were from Greek. And so Greek being in that sense, the prestige language, at least in the Christian context, um, you see that Old Nubian uh, scribes did made some efforts to make Old Nubian kind of look like Greek. And in one of the ways that they do this is sometimes they use a demonstrative uh, a pronoun as a relative pronoun, right? So no, no Nubian language, no now Nubian languages has a relative pronoun. Um, but somehow in certain translations, especially from Psalms, we find that they use a demonstrative pronoun as a relative pronoun. Uh, as in this case, so like uh, God chose us, making us his hairs, um, and the beauty of Jacob that he loved from Psalm 46. Um, so the beauty that he loved is this sentence right here. And that, which we also have in, in Greek, because actually this is a bilingual text, so we can see even the Greek from which the Nubian scribe translated, um, has a relative pronoun. Uh, and so has apparently the Old Nubian. Uh, even though it's very rare, we see here that, you know, uh, uh, a demonstrative pronoun is reused as a relative pronoun in order to, to make the translational Nubian closer to a Greek ideal uh, between quote marks. And you also see this, for example, in word order and several other things that are happening in these psalm translations. Um, and this is probably not something that any ordinary Nubian would have said uh, uh, in their daily lives. So let's go to um, number. So the singular is easy, uh, it's unmarked. Um, this is not a given. Uh, uh, nilo saharan languages and also several uh, Nubian languages um, have marked singulars or singulatives. Um, there are all kinds of traces of this system also in Old Nubian, but it's all been lexicalized. So it's become part of the lexicon and, and it seems that the speakers no longer really feel um, that singulars can be a marked thing. Um, so for all practical purposes, singulars are not marked in Old Nubian. Um, the things that are marked are jewels and plurals. Um, the jewel is fascinating uh, because it is. it seems to be either something very archaic uh, or a completely new invention. Um, as, as there are no uh, 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 languages close by that have a similar uh, jewel uh, uh, in, uh, you know, in, in, their, in their language. So this is a little bit of a mystery. Um, uh, the jewel appears in context in which you expect it to appear, you know, especially with body parts, with wings, you have two wings, you have two feet, you have two eyes, you have two ears. Um, but interestingly, the jewel has also been attested um, in, in, with two other uh, non-body parts, um, namely, uh, in, in one text, this, is, this only appears once in, in, in uh, the, the grave monuments for uh, King George, uh, as in a pair of dominions. Um, it is suggested that here is meant uh, Makuri and Alwa, uh, which were uh, in a uh, royal union uh, starting at around the 11th, 12th century. Um, and it is, it is thought or it is assumed that the pair of dominions refers to these two dominions of the king. Um, they were separate kingdoms, but they were unified under the same crown, a little bit like Austria, Hungary, this, this type of thing. Um, and then the, the last one, which is really exciting, um, is uh, the jewel for gods. Um, so uh, the word God in, uh, in, in Nubian is uh, Til. 
Um, it is usually used for the Christian God, but there are a few texts uh, in which the heathen gods are mentioned uh, in, in Greek. And because these are translations from Greek, we are pretty sure about the meaning of the word. And um, what is fascinating that whereas you have in Greek a plural uh, for gods, in, in both cases, in the Onubian, you find a jewel. Um, this suggests that when Old Nubian scribes and speakers of that language were referring to non-Christian gods, they had in specific two gods in mind. Um, the big million dollar question is, of course, which two gods are the gods that are not Christian? Uh, and so this is, of course, a fascinating uh, uh, question that we have not solved yet, um, as we only figured out that this is a jewel uh, uh, rather recently. For a long time, it was this was not considered to be a jewel, but uh, during field work, in, field work in 2018 in Dongola, uh, we found a psalm translation, so a text of which we really have a Greek translation, uh, a Greek version, um, which showed again this specific form, and there was no doubt that in this case it must be a jewel. So this also means that in this, in this specific text, which is uh, the Psalic Chrysostomos text, um, it, is, it should be interpreted as a dual. Um, so, but which two gods, uh, we can, we can only speculate, right? So this would be also very exciting because it suggests that while, uh, this society was, you know, Christian or, you know, had, had a Christian church, people still remembered the gods that used to roam the middle Nile Valley, uh, several centuries before that. And so this suggests this, this cultural memory has continued even though Christianity was uh, was there as let's say the the the, the prestige or prominent religion. Um, so so this this type of syncretism and this type of you know overlapping uh, cultural traditions is of course something that is still very much uh, an object uh, 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 that that should be researched. Uh, then um, our plurals. Um, we have two sets of plural suffixes. So one we already saw in an early example, which is this gu. Um, this is not obligatory uh, when plurality can be inferred from context. So sometimes your verb tells you that something is plural or sometimes you already said previously in, in, the, ten, in, the, in the text that something is plural and then you don't really need it. Um, but you usually see it. Like there are not that many contexts in which you actually drop it. So we have here, for example, urugu. So we see how it attaches. Uh, harmugu, heavens. So sometimes you have these um, epithetic vowels that appear. Um, I am not going to discuss phonology really deeply in this course, but uh, Old Nubian doesn't like large clusters of consonants bunching up all together one after the other. So when there are more than two, usually they dump in a, an empathetic vowel uh, to have uh, um, to have some space. And we have here with a little bit of a different spelling with a kappa, a dangigu uh, for a specific type of fish. Um, the second set of suffixes are plural suffixes in e. Um, these are definitely older than the ones in Gu in the sense that uh, plural suffixes in E are widespread throughout Nubian and Northern East Sudanic languages. So this is definitely the older uh, plural marking with Gu being the innovative plural marking. Um, and we find them, um, you know, quite, quite regularly on, on, different, uh, on different words, even on loan words. So you see, for example, here, Yuda Yosri for Jews, uh, Tini for cows, Jemli for years. And sipe uh, for nations, with the the epsilon here is actually a contraction of a yot and an alpha. Um, the plurals in e which have a consonant are usually quite easy to spot because this consonant is usually preserved. But as you can see also from uh, sipe, um, if you have a plural that's only an e, it often merges with adjacent vowels or it is reinterpreted as an epithetical vowel, which also happens quite often. So it's quite difficult to spot this plural uh, in the wild, let's say. Um, but we know it existed. Um, and you also can get um, combinations of the two, right? So you can think get things like mukriku dogs or ukriku days. And, um, and here we know from other, uh, let's say, instances that this E is a plural marker and it's not an epithetic vowel. Um, 
and Sachniku uh, anchorites, right? So we see this also appearing both with Nubian words like Muk or Ukur and uh, loan words like Sach, uh, Judaios, and probably also Sip is a, is a loan word. Um, these uh, plural suffixes in E, they are lexically determined. So you, you, need, to, you need to learn them, basically. Uh, uh, they are not predictable and they are part of the lexicon. Um, and then finally, um, we have three, let's say two real irregulars and one, uh, let's say systematic irregular. Um, so we have the word for woman or wife and the word for child, which have uh, uh, irregular plurals. Uh, Old Nubian is not a very irregular language. Like there are not many things that, that have exceptions or weird things going on. And this is actually one of the few instances in which we have like what you would call irregularity. Um, and we have a whole set of nouns that end in at or like this double T. Um, and they have plurals in I. So they exchange the double T for the, for the sound Y. Um, and here actually you see um, what, is, what is supposed to, what is, which is actually an ancient uh, uh, noun formation. So you have a plural in E or in I here, and you have a singular in at. And so this, this tau here, this T sound, uh, which is now analyzed as a nominalizer, um, is originally actually one of those singular markings, so a singulative. Uh, and there are other Nubian languages which still preserve this T as a singulative marker. Um, but in Old Nubian, this has been reanalyzed as a nominalizer, right? So, ikit, uh, 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 the verb means to lead, basically, and this is basically leader, right? So, this is like er in English, leader, ikit dat. Um, but we can see here that we still have this, let's say, irregular from, from let's say, Old Nubian perspective, uh, plural. But all, all, all words that end in this nominalizer in T have a plural in E. So that is regular about it. Um, then let's move to case. So um, usually we divide case into two subcategories. We have structural case. A structural case is um, case that is related to uh, uh, obligatory roles in a sentence, right? So what is that? That's your subject, that's your object, uh, direct or indirect. Um, those things that are needed by specific verbs, right? By intransitive, transitive, and, and ditransitive verbs. Um, they are structural because they belong to the structure, to the core of the sentence, let's say. Um, apart from structural cases, we also have a bunch of lexical cases. Um, which uh, are marking what you usually call adjuncts. So like in the garden, uh, against the wall, um, at three o'clock, right? So these types of, uh, 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 let's say, uh, decorations to your sentence that give more information about, you know, how, where, and when. And these are usually marked with lexical cases, and we will see them uh, a little bit later. Um, so Old Nubian is a nominative accusative language, which means that it marks the uh, subject of your intransitive verb with the same case as the uh, agent of your transitive verb. Um, and as a nominative accusative language, it is very similar, for example, to Arabic or to uh, Indo-European languages, um, but unlike, for example, an ergative language like uh, Georgian. Um, the nominative in Old Nubian is marked with zero. This again is typologically not very uh, special. Uh, many languages mark their most frequently occurring case with zero. Um, so there's nothing really to be seen. Um, and because Old Nubian is a nominative accusative language, it marks the subject of the intransitive verb and it also marks at the same time the agent of the transitive verb. So when you say, um, uh, I die, and uh, I hit a wall, then in both cases, the word for I is marked with the nominative case. Um, the genitive case um, is a bit special. Um, it does what a genitive case does, namely it marks possessors, uh, right? So the house uh, of John, um, but it also marks um, the subject of an intransitive verb or the agent of a transitive verb in 
a specific type of attributive relative clause. And this is kind of special because genitive subjects are not very frequent in the world's languages. Uh, but for example, this type of genitive marking in non-coreferential attributive relative clauses, and we'll discuss later what these precisely mean, uh, actually, for example, also occurs in Japanese. Uh, and so this is, this is a really fun thing about Old Nubian. Um, that, yeah, that's not, that's not everyday uh, case marking. Um, and we have then the accusative. Um, it's doing what it usually does. It is marking the patient or the object. Um, it's marking also um, animate recipients of ditransitive verbs, and we'll discuss what that precisely means. And also it's used for duration, which again, also uh, typologically, this is not a very strange thing. And then we have a dative. Um, it's been a debate for a while whether this is a dative. I think it is a dative because it does precisely what a dative does. Namely, it marks the uh, recipient of a ditransitive verb. Um, it only does this in certain circumstances, but when it does it, it does it well. Um, it also does other things that datives do, like marking location and direction and time. And it's kind of fun that Old Nubian has a dative because this case has been lost in all the other Nubian languages. And actually, when you look at, um, like, let's say, late Old Nubian texts, um, you actually see it disappearing. So this really becomes, uh, you know, in, in, in the record that we have of Old Nubian, we see this case like vanishing because it is so rare that at some point people are just like, what is this thing in La? This is definitely not something uh, 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 that we want to deal with as a separate category. And, and it's gone. Um, and, and that's language change in action. I mean, because in the end, like um, Old Nubian, we, we have a record of, of like a thousand, a little bit less than a thousand years of language production, right? So we expect the written language, even if it's super conservative, to change over time. And actually the textual record shows that. Uh, uh, we don't really have a good grip yet on where to place every single text on a timeline, but I think that, that, um, that we're getting a better sense of this uh, uh, more and more uh, in, recent, uh, in recent months, maybe recent year, recent months, it's a recent thing. Um, all right. And so, as I said, uh, lexical cases, uh, they mark adjuncts, right? So they, they, you know, they're locatives, you know, uh, uh, where something takes place. Um, they give directions. You have special case markers for things on top and things below. Um, you have a vocative that is about to die out. It appears only with a very few nouns. Um, you have a commutative um, that is used for with, like if you do something with something else, somebody else, or if you're doing uh, a match against somebody else. And we have an ad as if, very problematic. It probably means something like adjacent or next to. Um, we don't have a lot of attestations and it's a little bit like, uh, I'm not sure if this is really a thing. Um, but we cannot, we cannot find any other way of, of dealing with it. So, you know, we put it, or I, I put it here. What, what can I say? Um, so like many other languages, um, we have a set of postpositions, which gives you even more detailed lexical information about where or when or how something is happening, whether it's inside or because of, or during or after. Um, and um, like prepositions in, in the European languages, they take a specific case. Uh, and in, the ca in Old Nubian, this is usually a locative. Um, not always, as we will now see. So let's first um, have a little check about um, our case marking here. Um, as I said, case marking marks the end of a phrase, right? So we have a dative here. This is our entire noun phrase. The dative appears at the right edge. Um, and we have here a very long noun phrase, the Church of the Holy Virgin Mary. Um, that's one single noun phrase um, with a possessor here marked with a genitive. Again, at the end of this, like let's say embedded noun phrase. And then here the whole thing, this whole thing is marked with a nominative. Um, you see here sometimes like topic and focus markers. That's what top and foc means. Um, we will discuss them in a later class. Let's see what else we have. 
Oh yeah. So one thing about um, like one more thing about this dative. Um, in Old Nubian, it appears that there's a distinction between animate and inanimate indirect objects, right? So an indirect object is something is, uh, for example, I give the book to Mary, right? So it's a recipient of an action. Uh, that's an indirect object. Um, and when the indirect object is animate, it's a living being, usually a human, um, then we usually find an accusative. But when it is inanimate, like a church, in this case, we find a dative. Um, because most recipients in daily life are animate, um, we usually find an accusative. But in the cases, for example, when people donate a book to a church, um, we clearly see that the dative is used. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's how it is with inanimates. And with animates, uh, we see an accusative, right? So here, uh, let God give me the inheritor of power, the book. And so um, the book should be given to this uh, inheritor of power, which is this noun phrase here. Um, you can see actually here also very nicely that um, old Nubian scribes, especially uh, when they write on walls and other you know, informal uh, mediums, um, spelling changes, right? So we expect a double kappa here, we see a single one. We expect t lilo, but t lilo is written. Um, we have to deal with these spelling variations. Uh, uh, there is just no other way. And so uh, this sometimes makes our interpretation also quite uh, difficult. Also actually of this specific phrase, which, you know, I think this is a pretty okay analysis, but I'm really not entirely sure. Um, then we have our postpositions. Uh, there are two types. Uh, denominal and deverbal. Um, this is a distinction that I've made based on the etymology uh, of the postposition. So some of the postpositions derive from nouns and other ones derive from verbal roots. Um, the nice thing about this distinction is, is that all the ones with a verbal root all go with a locative. When they're derived from a nominal root, there is a lot more variation, right? You see combinations with a determiner, with a locative, with a genitive. Um, and because they derive from a nominal root, like the use of a genitive here uh, is also not completely unexpected, right? You know, you would say, uh, I am inside the house or I'm inside of the house, right? I am beside the house, I'm, I'm to the side of the house. So, so also in English, you see that there is this uh, link between prepositions and, and genitive constructions. Um, and, and we have the same thing happening in, uh, in Old Nubian. So here we see uh, one in action. At sunrise, they gathered together and lied within their cave. Um, within their cave, we have right here, uh, we have cave um, marked with a determiner. And so the determiner sometimes appears in these types of uh, uh, postpositional contexts. It is suggested that this is actually the oldest construction Right, so this is the first one that was used and then later we see the development of a genitive and finally we see the development of locative constructions, um, which are still present in, in, in present day Nobin. Um, and we have a postposition here. We have a set of the verbal postpositions as well. Um, right, so we have, for example, uh, deriving from the verb to come, from the verb to have, also from the verb to have, from the verb to come, from the verb to give from the verb to go, right? So these are like, let's say fossilized uh, and, and phonologically reduced verbal forms um, that go together with uh, a locative case law. And they all do and consistently do that, right? So this also suggests that maybe even this, all these deverbal postpositions are also a later development in the language itself. And here we see one, um, keep them through your name. Um, here we have our noun phrase. The noun phrase is marked with the locative and followed by this postposition, go through. How are we doing on time? I think, I think we're gonna make good time again today. Um, oh, sorry, I just saw uh, uh, a comment here uh, from Weil that Arabic has a jewel. Uh, that's correct. I mean, there are many surrounding languages 
uh, I mean, Old Egyptian has a jewel, right? So there are many surrounding languages that have a jewel, um, but these are not linguistically related languages. And a jewel is not something that you would borrow from another language without borrowing a shitload of other things as well. Um, so the fact that a jewel cannot be reconstructed for, let's say, proto-Nubian, um, or at least not yet, maybe it can and we just don't have enough information, uh, suggests that either uh, uh, this is a very archaic thing uh, or, um, uh, or it's an invention, which, which may very well be, right? Languages invent jewels as well. Uh, this, is, this, is not, this is not very strange. Um, so, but it, it's unlikely that this is taken from another uh, adjacent language, especially a language as Arabic, with which Old Nubian came into contact, you know, rather late, uh, uh, only after um, uh, Egypt was uh, occupied by uh, or, or conquered by uh, Arabic speaking uh, groups. All right, finally, we have. Uh, qualification. So qualification is anything that you can add to your noun to give it more definition, um, such as a possessor. So I am, uh, I go to the church of St. Minas. So I'm not going to, I'm going to this specific church. Um, in that case, we use uh, a genitive uh, indicating a, a type of possessor relationship. Um, of course, St. Minas doesn't really own the church, but he is associated with it and he is uh, he is, let's say, the protector of this particular church. Um, and we see here again the entire noun phrase and with our case marking at the very end, right? And also the case marking of the genitive comes at the end of the embedded noun phrase, holy minas, right? So we very often see like this type of embedding structure uh, going on. Um, so qualifiers, um, such as adjectives and, and relative, clauses, uh, relative clauses, they usually follow the noun, right? So um, we see here uh, the word uh, for priests. It has a plural in E. Um, note also that plurals in E don't come at the end of the noun phrase. They actually attach directly to the noun root. Um, which again suggests that these things are really lexically encoded, right? They're not analyzed as, as separate morphemes that you can move around and just put them at the end of your phrase. They're really part of the, of the lexical item itself. Um, for example, um, this whole thing itself is also plural because there are 24 of, 24 of them. And at the end of the noun phrase, we find uh, our regular plural marker, gu. Right, so um, by the way, this, is prob this probably shouldn't be actually a plural marker. Anyhow, that's probably my mistake. But we see the regular uh, plural marker go here at the very end of the entire noun phrase. While the noun itself also is, in, is, is showing up in its, let's say, plural form. Um, again, this is not predictable and you'll have, you'll have just to know that, that Sorto does this. Um, but what is important is that all the adjectives follow, right? So the word for white, or in this case, very white or sparkling white, as I translated it, and 24 here, um, and also the relative clause, which we'll look at a bit, uh, which we'll look at in a bit, uh, glory having or glorious, uh, all follows the noun. And this is the regular order. Uh, qualifiers follow the noun. However, they can also precede them. Um, and so in this case, uh, for example, we see uh, something very similar to the previous sentence, uh, four incorporeal glorious animals. Um, we see the word for animal here and the word for four here. So one qualifier, the word for four follows as we expected, but the word uh, for incorporeal and glorious uh, precede. And what it means is that whenever you have qualifiers preceding your noun, um, we are dealing with a restrictive meaning. And what does it mean, a restrictive meaning? It means that these qualifications, um, let's say, are, are uh, an inalienable, essential part of the noun that we're dealing with, right? Um, so these animals, the, the four animals of the apocalypse, um, uh, right, or the four animals that represent the, uh, the uh, evangelists, 
they are by necessity and always glorious and incorporeal, right? Um, it's difficult to express this in English, but it basically means that um, that we're not joking, talking about just animals, but we're talking about the glorious, bodiless, specific animals that we all know, namely the four animals of the uh, 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 apocalypse, right? What is it? The, the angel, the, the lion, the, the, the bull, and the lion. Or did it say lion and the eagle, right? So four specific ones that we all know about. Um, right, then, as I said, like adjectives, attributive relative clauses also usually follow the noun. Um, an attributive relative clause uh, is a clause that um, contains a verb um, and in which the subject of that verb is also the antecedent of that relative clause. Now, this sounds very complex, but here is an example. Uh, the boatsman that hears you, right? So this is your um, this is your attributive relative clause. Sorry, there was something in my in my eye. This is the attributive relative clause, but the subject of the verb to hear is also the antecedent uh, of the clause itself, right? So the antecedent and the subject of the clause are one and the same thing. I have to apologize for a second. Sorry. Um, so that is what is an attributive relative clause that is, um, as we call it, co-referential, namely the antecedent of the relative clause and its subject are one and the same thing. Here in this case, the boatsman. Um, when we have a non-co-referential relative clause, um, it is the object of the verb in a relative clause that is the same as the antecedent, right? So in this case, the boatsman that you hear, the boatsman, the antecedent of our relative clause is the object of the verb, ulgeril, um, which has a subject here, you. And so as I said before, when we discussed the genitive, when we have a subject in a non-coreferential attributive relative clause, it is marked with a genitive, as we can see here. Um, these are examples, by the way, that I made up, um, but there are also examples in the wild that show precisely this, this marking. I just made these examples up, so we have this contrast, the contrast uh, uh, clear, right? So again, co-referential relative clause, the subject is the antecedent, non-co-referential relative clause, the object is the antecedent. Uh, and the subject of the relative clause is marked with the genitive. Here, the object in the relative clause is marked with the accusative as we would expect it to be, right? Um, and so again, as with adjectives, whenever a relative clause precedes uh, a noun, they have a restrictive reading, right? So here, again, in English, it's difficult to render, right? But you can say the boatsman that you hear you mean that specific boatsman that you're hearing um, rather than the boatsman that you're, that you're not hearing, right? So maybe you're living in a village in where there are two boatsmen, one is mute and the other one is not mute. And so you can refer to the one that's not mute with the boatsman that you hear, right? Because the other one you cannot hear because he's, he's mute. And so in this case, the not hear or the, the, the hearing part or the hearing him part is, is a specific attribute of this boatsman and therefore it can be uh, 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 therefore, it's a restrictive reading. Um, sorry, I see a message here from Asma. Um, so, is it safe to say that in the case of qualifiers preceding the nouns to add emphasis and thus we have a restrictive reading? Um, I wouldn't say that um, that it adds emphasis. Um, I would say that uh, 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 qualifiers that precede nouns um, give you a restrictive reading or or uh, which is a term from semantics, but you can also say they give something that is an essential quality uh, of, um, of the noun that they qualify. It's inalienable. It is always there um, and everybody knows it. Um, that's maybe how you could paraphrase that. So, so I hope that is, that is helpful. For translation purposes, it doesn't really matter because English doesn't make any distinction. Um, maybe other languages do, they probably do, but English doesn't. So in the English translations, as you can see, you, you don't really see any difference. 
Um, all right, and then finally, relative clauses can be also used independently. Um, so for example, you can talk about uh, the people that hear or those that hear um, by, uh, by, relative, by, by using a relative clause independently, right? So your relative clause is here, uh, it's very tiny, <laughs> um, and with a plural marker and uh, a determiner, those that hear. And then you can use this uh, let's say nominalized relative clause as the subject of your sentence, for example, yeah. or the object or, you know, whatever you want to do with it. It becomes a noun. Um, then very quickly, very quickly, uh, we have to talk about coordination. It's not super exciting, but um, Old Nubian has a really a large number of ways in which you can put two nouns A and B together. Um, in English, we usually use the word and, and that's about it. Um, but as you can see, Old Nubian has several variations. You can just put the nouns one next to the other. That's okay. You can use a conjunction, on, in between. You can use the suffixes, de and de ker. And you can use a combination of de and de ker plus on. And we actually find all the variations and combinations of these, uh, uh, of these types. Um, and I'm just going to show you... Um, right, you can see here also with three, you can do de, de, de ker, de, on, de, de ker, de, de, on, de ker, de, on, de, on, de ker. Um, apparently, this there seems simply to be free variation. Uh, I have not been able to find any regularity in this, um, and it, it gives you a fun. Uh, uh, actually, you find you find all of these. Um, especially because um, there is a frequent sentence that is used in the opening of letters and so on, like this has been written in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So they invoke the Holy Trinity. And so you find all of these variations in, in that formula without, without any seeming uh, difference between them. Um, let's, say what, let's see what we have here. I think I have two examples of this. Um, uh, his is the glory and the power. Um, the glory and the power here. So we see here the usage of the conjunction on. Um, and we see here an example where they use the suffixes. So when you take the sacrament, purify your heart and feelings. So your heart and feelings here, we have heart with the conjunction and feelings with the conjunction. And again, notice that this whole thing is your noun phrase and only at the end of the noun phrase we find the accusative case marker right so it doesn't come here it doesn't come here it only comes at the very end we have a few other ones uh, either or neither nor uh, and but as you can see they they all you know kind of look the same they feel the same and they kind of work the same uh, here is one example uh, it is from a lunary which is a form of horoscope uh, the one who has been born uh, on this specific day, right? So this is related to a specific lunar date. The one who has been born will be either lame or something that we don't know or uh, blind. And we see this menon and menon here used twice. That's it for today. So um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Thank you, Alexandros. <laughs> um, or maybe some people have something through Facebook and then maybe Mazin can tell me if something is um, happening. Ah, so has a question. Okay, may I ask uh, directly? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank yeah, you so yeah, much easy. for a very wonderful lecture as always. Um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if this um, case, case markers, for example, ka, uh, can be uh, an enclitic, like case enclitic, like Japanese, o, wa, ga, etc. Uh, you, 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 you mean whether case, case markers should be analyzed as a clitic? Yeah, kind of critic, but it's not critic like Wakanagi critic like De Gar in Greek, but but like case critic like Japanese. Yeah. Ka, e, ga, o, yeah. E, if you use this kind of um, um Yeah, I I, under uh, I understand um, I understand what you're saying. Let me just go back to this uh here. Um yeah, I, I suppose that um that you could call them critics. I, I honestly 
I am not a very strong believer in clitics um, as, as a useful term, uh, in a sense that there seems to be an enormous amount of confusion about what clitics are and about their definitions. And so, um, you know, I am, I'm fine with calling them clitics. I usually call them suffixes because they come at the end. And I think it's a bit of a more neutral term. When, it, when you call them clitics, you also imply that, you know, at some point they were like independent, or at least when you talk about verbal clitics, usually you talk about these things as, as formally independent personal pronouns. Um, I know that, for example, in Japanese, they're really, I mean, they're really distinct, but in Old Nubian, you see this, the thing also like fusing with the noun. You know, I, I think this is, this is, at the end, is, is a rather... Uh, is a terminological discussion um, yeah, that, that yeah. it has very little effect on the analysis. Um, I know that there are people that say, well, when it only comes at the end of the noun phrase, it's a clitic. When it's distributive, it's a suffix. I am not so sure whether I think that's a useful distinction. Um, yeah, that, that's what uh, Martin Haspem is saying. Yeah. I think he wrote about the, this uh, confusion about the, you know, about yeah. the definitions of critics among scholars. There is a lot of confusion about it. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah, that's no standard, you know, no definition. It's also because, uh, and we will see this maybe when we discuss the verb is because uh, general linguistics talks about clitics in a very different way than uh, descriptive linguistics. So what are mm. clitics, you know, in a descriptive tradition are not clitics in let's say uh, a generative syntax tradition yeah like Zvitsky and Zvitsky exactly. has a very exactly yeah. so so i try to i mean i use the word clitic for one specific set mm. of suffixes on the verb and mm. when i talk about it as clitics you know at the nilo saharan linguistics conference then all the linguists are like these are not clitics i said yes but i come from a different tradition and that's what we call clitics so like uh you know it's a bit of an endless discussion i feel Right, that's true, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and as long as it doesn't contribute to our understanding hmm. in any meaningful way, or it predicts certain aspects of the marker that otherwise you wouldn't be able to discover, then I feel a little bit agnostic about it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a question that has really uh, kept me busy for a while. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when yeah, when yeah, I was sure. writing the grammar, yeah. Sure, that's true. Uh, um, a question. Yeah, uh, it's sure, please. Uh, is it okay to um, ask a very small, another question? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, um, how, how frequent is the exchange between kappa and gamma, uh, kappa mm. and uh, gamma, like iku yeah. and igu, guku and so on? Um, uh, Kek is really a phoneme or? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, as we also discussed yesterday, uh, the distinction between voiced and voiceless consonants in, in Nubian languages in general is not as strong as it is in, for example, in European languages or as it is in Arabic. Um, so, the only distinction that is strong and stable is the distinction between T and D. Uh, as I said yesterday, probably because there's also distinction in place. I think that the T maybe have been pronounced, you know, uh, or one of the two have may, may have been pronounced a little bit more to the back. Um, the D, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You see in general, not that many alternations between Kappa and Gamma in Old Nubian. Um, but it exists and that's why I put it here. It's not, uh, uh, it's not a common occurrence, especially not with a frequent uh, um, uh, morpheme like the plural morpheme. It occurs so often that probably there was some form of, you know, intrinsic standardization on how you write that. But, uh, you know, for example, the word, the Greek loan word for icon, egon, is written either with a kappa or a gamma. And there are a few other attestations. Um, it also depends on whether the text is a literary text or a documentary text. In literary text, you see less, you see more standardization in how, how people write it. In, 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 in documentary text, you know, this alternation is more frequent because most probably 
um, intervocalically, so between vowels, the kappa was pronounced as g. Uh, it, it still is in, in, in modern Nubian languages. So, so um, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not infrequent, but depending on the type of text, you will find more or less of it. Um, so there is a question here from Asma. I was wondering where to find the YouTube link for this recorded lecture. So Asma, um, I tweet the link out for the YouTube upload that I make every evening. I was able to make the upload also of yesterday. It's on YouTube. I think if you if you go on YouTube and you search for Old Nubian, you will find the recording of the lecture. There are not that many YouTube videos about Old Nubian and, and uh, you should be able to find it uh, either on my own channel um, which I created specifically to upload these lectures, or uh, on the channel of the Nubia Initiative uh, or Nubia Fest YouTube channel. I think they also host versions of this lecture that have been streamed through various digital platforms uh, and then recorded in a way that I don't understand. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? Well, if there are none, then uh, it's three to eight. So I think again, we did great on time. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, all the people that came new today, welcome again. Uh, I'm very happy to see more and more people coming to this lecture. It's really fun to do. And I hope it's also really fun for you. Um, and we will uh, continue tomorrow, I think with a whole bunch of different topics like quantification, predication, a person, so a whole bunch of various uh, topics before on Thursday, we're going to the verb, which is like our main, let's say our main course of the week. Um, we're, we're doing first all the, the side dishes and the desserts. Um, and so hope to see you tomorrow uh, at the same time, seven o'clock. And uh, please also attend all the other wonderful sessions in, uh, in Nubia Fest. And I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you all very much. <laughs>